because uh, this is a session, a very important session on India, on Hinduism's different traditions, uh, which will be chaired by Mr. Manishankar Ayer and lectured by my former dear teacher, Professor Rajiv Bhargav, uh, whose published work is recently published, I not read, but I'm really looking forward to the session. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, at least for Indians, Dr. Rajiv Bhargav does not require any introduction. He is among the most uh, influential of our intellectuals, and he has a profound understanding of issues such as the one he is going to be addressing today, uh, the divergent interpretations, versions of Hinduism. I'd just like to say that the word Hindu does not exist in any Indian language. It came as a result of the Persians not being able to properly pronounce the sound sir. So when Alexander asked, who are these people at the Sindhu River, his Persian translator said Hindu instead of Sindhu. And it is from them, it's a Macedonian contribution to Indian history that we now talk about Hindus and Hinduism. But over to Dr. Bhargav, and after he's spoken, I'll make a few comments. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, thank you, Mani, and thank you, Rahul, for uh, including me in this workshop. Uh, I can uh, uh, see and hear many friends. Uh, I wish I could be physically present there, but I'm, I'm unfortunately unable to do so, so I'm happy to be uh, uh, available on Zoom. Uh, so let me uh, begin by making a couple of points. One, that democracy is uh, not an ancient idea. It is very much a modern, more recent contemporary idea, which, was, uh, which has emerged in the 1920th century. Uh, and therefore, no one can claim uh, to be the mother or the father or the parent of democracy, not even Greece, uh, for reasons that I'll just explain in a minute. Uh, second, uh, we do have a tradition of democracy, but this tradition is very much an invention in the sense in which people like Hobsbawm and Terence Ranger have talked about the invention of tradition. Uh, there is a tradition of democracy in India, but equally, there is a tradition of anti-democracy in India, and I shall talk about, and both are deeply intertwined. Uh, one can't talk about one without really talking about the other. Uh, and uh, we uh, can see uh, how both of them are, are, are uh, you know, uh, are living traditions uh, in India today. Uh, third point is that uh, democracy can be seen uh, as, of course, a, as a form of government. Uh, but I would say that it can also be seen as a network of social and political practices. And if you see democracy as a, or, or, uh, as a practice, then one can find democratic practices not only in what we formally recognize to be democracies today, but also in in uh, in uh, you know aristocracies in 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 monarchies uh, although they these practices are marginal so when one is looking at the history of democracy or democra de democracy then one may not just look at you know what's happening in 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 what we formally recognize as democracies but also uh, at you know at, also at other forms of government in the past. 
Uh, I would rather think of democracy not only as a form of government, but as a mode of social and political life, given that I've also talked about democracy as a network of social and political practices. If uh, I'd still like to distinguish uh, this, com you know, sis the system, uh, whether it's a so social and political system of democracy, from what I call elements of democracy and uh, elements that go on to make uh, uh, the 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 mode of social and political democracy and democracy as a form of government. And I think it's much more fruitful. Uh, when we go back to the ancient traditions to look at these elements rather than to look at democracy as a mode of government, which, as I said, is a much more recent uh, invention. Uh, so I'm, when I talk about uh, is there a tradition of ancient democracy, is there, is there an ancient tradition of democracy in India? I'm really looking at the presence of democratic elements in uh, traditions in past traditions, uh, uh, elements that at, at a particular point of time, uh, at a particular conjuncture, configure uh, to produce uh, what we now recognize as democracy, right? Uh, so what are these elements? Uh, what, what, is, uh, what are these elements when they come together uh, and they uh, uh, they are configured uh, by a, in, in a certain conjuncture. They happen to contingently come together and generate something like democracy. Uh, what are these elements? I would say that there are nine. I wish I could, you know, present them on on a on a piece of uh, a white uh, board. But uh, I hope uh, you will uh, somehow find uh, enough concentration to remember. Uh, the first of these elements is that all members of a political, uh, all, all, all people living in a particular territory, regardless of religion, gender, creed, race, ethnicity, language, are, are members of a political community. Everyone living in the territory is a member of a political community. That, I would say, is the first uh, sort of uh, element of what democracy is. Inclusiveness is a very central uh, idea of democracy. Uh, and the second is that all these members are equal. They are citizens of a community, but they're equal members of a community. And these two uh, features uh, will uh, immediately make you realize why I think that there was no ancient democracy even in Greece. Uh, that democracy uh, had did not have a positive balance in most of human history, uh, because these are features that we have come to recognize as valuable even only in 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 the recent past. Uh, following, if you look at the implications of these two features, one is that if there is a in a in a, a state in such a political community. Uh, will not discriminate on grounds of religion or language or or gender or race or in or caste and uh, not only that different groups will be given recognition as equals right uh, of course in the past there could be equality of subjecthood in monarchies too, uh, if the, the state can be impartial uh, to its subjects and treat all its subjects, whether they are individuals or as groups or groups, they can see them as equals. And, and in, a, in a sense, that, that would be a democratic element in a, in a monarchy, right? Uh, where the king is relates to the ruler relates to his or her subjects the king relates to his subjects but it relates to his subjects in a manner in which all of them are treated as equals not only equally but also as equals and i would say that this is a very important uh, feature uh, present in the past that could be very helpful in the making of modern democracies uh, apart from these four 
uh, features. Uh, uh, other elements come into play. One is that the state will not align itself to any one, say, religion uh, or language, but will always uh, will will not give any monopolistic privilege uh, to any uh, ethnic group or 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 or, or religion. Uh, so I would I would say that this is one bundle of features that are constitutive of democracy. Uh, then we come to another very important feature, and that is pacification of politics. Power is transferred peacefully, not violently. Uh, another feature which is very important is that there is an open and vibrant public sphere in which uh, or through which representatives are chosen freely and where issues are discussed, debated uh, and contested, uh, but non-violently through discussion. So uh, government, any decision making is done through discussion. If there is a government, then that government of in that society is by discussion. And that's, again, a very important feature of democracies. It follows from that that if there is a free and open public sphere where views are discussed freely, exchanged freely, then there is toleration of dissent. And people who are seen to be different are are viewed as temporary adversaries and not permanent enemies. And that's very, very crucial in, in a democracy. And if there are societies which in their past had this distinction, then one can say that they already had some elements of democracy present in them. So uh, did India have a, a, a milieu a social and a political milieu where they did not treat the other as an enemy to be eliminated? Or did they see them, whenever they had some disagreement, they saw them only as temporary adversaries? That would be a very important uh, way to explore or to, to, uh, to uh, evaluate whether you know, a society such as India had a democratic tradition or not. And finally, uh, or, or rather two more features, one is a willingness to negotiate and compromise in the interest of the wider community, in the interest of fraternity. Uh, the presence of virtues uh, for all this uh, to happen, the presence of two very important virtues. One is sanyama, a restraint. Uh, and second is uh, to be a good listener. Bahushruta, uh, uh, to listen to the many before you come to arrive, when, when, before you arrive at a decision, to listen to the many. Uh, that's a very, these are very important features of uh, democracy. And finally, for the effective exercise of one's citizenship, uh, what is required is perhaps not uh, e eco equality, economic equality, but a modicum of material well being. So, even in the if in the past rulers were committed to uh, some level of material well-being of their subjects, and if that tradition con continued, uh, then one would say that there was some kind of a tradition of some uh, some elements. Some there is in in our traditions there are some elements of democracy even though those elements are present within a monarchical setup and not in a proper democratic setup. Okay, so uh, uh, I would say that uh, if these are what go into the making of a full-fledged democracy, this is a rather thick conception, but I think that this is the most valuable conception that we have. Uh, if this is what our conception of democracy is, then it follows that, uh, I'm reiterating the point that I made earlier, that there is no country which can claim to be democratic in the past. 
It's only in the 9th, 20th century, really, that we start thinking, uh, realizing the idea of democracy. And democracy itself begins to have a, a positive balance only in the 20th century and not in the past. But that doesn't preclude us from thinking about the presence of democratic elements in our traditions in, 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 in the past. Okay, uh, so uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, there is there is a there are many of these elements are present in India and uh, in, in the in the in the uh, traditions, uh, not only in in uh, what we what and Mani you know anticipated what I had to say about the term Hindu. What is what one can say is uh, the first two millennia uh, of uh, or three millennia if of Indian history. Uh, uh, starting from say 1500 BC, uh, I there is the, some of many of these elements are present, and one can proudly claim them as our heritage. But as I said, there are other elements that must be also always taken into account, which keep challenging these these things that we value today. Uh, uh, okay, uh, so uh, there are two. Broad of, the, I mean, I'm give, giving you a very general sort of picture, but I would, before I elaborate in the rest of the time that is available to me, uh, I would say that there are two broad uh, traditions. One is a democratic tradition, which is inspired by a pluralist imaginary that values mutual acceptance and civility between different uh, groups, particularly between different religious philosophical groups. And uh, other elements which uh, tend to f facilitate government by discussion, a public discussion. Uh, and there is another uh, tradition uh, that is present in India, uh, which is uh, uh, masculine, uh, which is uh, driven by a warrior ethic, uh, by real politic, uh, and uh, that directly or indirectly uh, supports the hierarchical Dharamshastric worldview, which is deeply which is deeply conservative, and all of this uh, constitutes what I call the anti-democratic tradition. Uh, the the real father of the first tradition is the Emperor Ashoka, who is uh, as an as the as an emperor, uh, he is not aligned to any religion. So. No religion can claim to be, uh, you know, the father of the Indian democratic tradition. That honor, if at all, ha uh, goes to someone, it must go to this figure, this crucial figure uh, 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 called Ashoka. But uh, and the inheritors of that tradition uh, and and uh, and uh, are are Gandhi, uh, Ambedkar, Nehru, and several others. Uh, and it is this tradition that is that has inspired the, the constitution that we adopted in 1950. Uh, the other tradition uh, has very uh, other notable figures, but I think one figure who we can immediately uh, mention, and I will probably I'll try to quote from, uh, from him, is Savarkar, uh, who is uh, very much for a, a, a masculine uh, warrior ethic. Uh, and uh, uh, even when he wants uh, 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 something like a republic, uh, the members of a republic have to be militaristic, uh, and therefore violence plays a very important role there. Okay, so let me, uh, in the last seven or eight minutes, let me talk briefly about the anti-democratic tradition first, which coexists, as I said, with the democratic tradition. Now, what, are, what is this anti-democratic tradition? I've already mentioned the warrior ethic. Uh, that is found in the Rig Veda. Uh, the main virtues that are propagated are deeply masculine. The god uh, who is a very important god in the Rig Veda is... Indra, who is also the god of war, he's not only the god of rain and thunder, but also the god of war of God, 
Indra is glorified precisely because he's masculine and violent. Uh, he has ojas, which is, you know, uh, uh, violent energy. Uh, Indra, these are many, uh, uh, th there are verses present in the Rig Veda which talk about Indra smashing and pulverizing rivals, destroying them, crushing them, splitting them apart, breaking their breaking the enemy's rage. Uh, there are verses which talk about enemies being conquered, subjugated. So uh, Rig Vedic poets and priests uh, really reflect, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the culture of that period uh, by propagating a, a violent masculine ideology, uh, strength and toughness, the word is uh, the Sanskrit words are veer and shur, which are very masculine uh, uh, terms. Uh, uh, these are all uh, valued in in several uh, verses of the Rig Veda. I'm sure there are other verses which which are very different in quality and and character. But but uh, the one that I want to emphasize uh, and the one that people who Imagine a hyper masculine in India today must rely on on this on 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 uh, these verses, uh, and this this warrior ethic is gloriously amoral. It exalts ruthlessness. It brooks no conception of justice, and it permits the use of any means to achieve uh, self-aggrandizing political ends. So that's one tradition which is deeply anti-democratic. Uh, the second tradition is the Arthashastra tradition. Uh, uh, Artha here is this worldly success. Uh, it's not just economic uh, success, as many people would like to believe, but it's this worldly success uh, which matters above all ends, which matters even more than, more, more than dharma. Uh, and and uh, the, the advice in the Arthashastra is given to a monarch who is centrally concerned with keeping and maintaining power through force, that is through danda. So statecraft, the power of statecraft is, is, is again glorified in Arthashastra uh, and, and uh, over any moral norms or uh, any ethical norms. Uh, so that's the second tradition that the anti-democratic uh, 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 people may, may rely upon. Uh, and the third, of course, is the Dharamshastra, uh, particularly the modern Dharamshastra, which uh, is, is, is in many ways uh, not only reiterating some of these things, but which make uh, dharma or morality uh, jati or varna specific. And these jatis and varnas are arranged in a hierarchical order. So what, what the, the, the warrior ethic is present, but it is now restricted to the Kshatriyas. Uh, uh, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are role specific and context specific. Artha is now reduced to uh, economic activity uh, and uh, that again is restricted to the to the to to to, to a particular jati or uh, varna, uh, the Kshatriyas. And civility is also glorified as a value but it's made specific to the Shudras and the Ati Shudras. So uh, there, there are there there there, there uh, each there is uh, there is no single universal moral. Uh, these are there are different uh, moralities or ethics which are each varna or jati specific. And uh, 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 as I said, uh, in this too. Uh, the warrior ethic has a very important role, but and so does uh, economic success, uh, and uh, all of this is is kind of uh, undergirded by uh, by by the value of civility, which is also made specific to a caste, and the people who give intellectual justification for this are the Brahmins, uh, who wrote the Dharam Shastra. Not all Brahmins. Uh, but but uh, some a specific group of Brahmins who wrote the Dharma Shastra uh, uh, for the Brahmins, and it was largely about Brahmins. But there was a whole narrative being built of 
of how society has to be organized along the 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 the, uh, the li lines which are specified by the dharma shastra brahmins all these traditions i'm afraid are living in india today they are not uh, dead and they are some of the biggest obstacles that we have towards realizing uh, 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 the democratic tradition about which I will now talk. Uh, uh, I would, I can add one more. Uh, there are two traditions that I have not going to talk about, the Indo-Islamic tradition and the Indo-European tradition. And certainly from both, you can get inputs into this anti-democratic tradition, particularly from the Indo-European tradition, both not, not only about British imperialism, but in the case of uh, some of the people who are in power today, the inspiration that they get from it, the Italian fascists and the German Nazis. So uh, all of that is, uh, they, they, they feed into all the indigenous elements that I just spoke, to, spoke about. There is a second tradition, and I'll speak very briefly about it. This is the, the so-called Republican tradition, the, 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 the tradition of Gana Sanghas and, and Gana Rajas. Uh, and here, I think the this can be this tradition can be utilized both by the Democrats and by the anti-Democrats, because these republics, as Ramalath Hapad calls them, ancient clan republics, uh, and and uh, arist these are kind of aristocracy. Arist uh, they're not uh, fully de democratic in the sense in which we understand them, but to try and uh, trace, you can trace. Uh, modern democracies to some of these uh, gansangs, uh, but uh, to to think of them as the sole inspiration for modern democracy would be utterly mistaken. Uh, the the gansangas were called so because uh, may, they were apart from the monarch, uh, and uh, there were some limitations on the kind of on on the autocratic rule of the monarch. Uh, in some Ganasangas, uh, there was an advisory con council made of elders, from which women, by the way, were excluded. And the, the, the king was morally obliged to consult these guys, but these guys were never really part of the decision making. This, the decision making was made by the ruler, by the autocratic ruler himself. Uh, but there were other uh, forms of Ganasangas where uh, the role of the advisory council was of the of the council uh, was not merely to advise but also to help uh, decision making power so they were really part of the uh, uh, of decision making however uh, uh, these two are not properly democratic because although all those people who were part of the council were equal uh, to one another uh, this equality was very restricted. It was only confined to, say, about, I'm just giving a figure, to 200 people or 500 people or 1,000 people, but never really go, gone, uh, went beyond them. These were like ancient Roman republics or even ancient uh, democracies of Greece where citizens had equality, but there were so many people who were left out that this equality was very restrictive. Uh, but But one can... You know, one can rely on some of these uh, traditions. Uh, some of these elements can go into what we call the democratic tradition, but the other elements can easily be taken in a, in, in a non-anti-democratic uh, uh, way. And uh, Savarkar, who I mentioned earlier, took uh, made references to the Gansak, Gansangas, uh, but, but took them in the anti-democratic direction. <clears throat> now, uh, so then we come to the third major tradition, which I would like to claim as the democratic tradition. And as I said, the father of this tradition is, uh, is, uh, is Ashoka. And the reason why I say that is, A, he rejected war. He introduced the idea of pacification of politics, which is extremely important in democracy. Uh, he abandoned the idea of of uh, of of uh, conquest by war 
and replaced it by what he called a dhammic conquest. That is to say, the conquest of other people by a certain political ethic or by a certain social ethic, rather than uh, the conquest of them by 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 force and and therefore uh, by domination. Uh, so, of course, he was a monarch. He was a king. He was an emperor. But uh, he 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 went. Uh, he, I, I think the the way that he uh, made uh, the first ever anti-war statement, the like of which we haven't seen anywhere in the world, even until recently. Uh, 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 I would like to see Mr. Bush apologize or, or Mr. Blair apologize for what they did in Iraq. Uh, I'd like to see uh, many uh, 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 democracies today which go to war against other peoples apologize for their acts. Uh, but but uh, uh, that's that's that that never happens, and that's exactly what Ashoka did uh, when he gave up the idea of of, of war. Uh, so he he redefined rulership, he redefined kingship, he redefined uh, what he imagined uh, was imperialism. Uh, he introduced the idea that the ruler works for the material benefits. Of, of his people. The words that he uses in his inscriptions are a jana sukha and a jana hita. Uh, sarva jana sukha, sarva jana hita. He rejected the idea of personal glory, uh, which is so important. Uh, uh, of course, there was no active citizenship in, in that period. There was not even citizenship in that period. But he introduced subjects after a point of time in his in his in his rulership uh, he uh, he he made he tried to make the polity inclusive and pluralist he tried to give recognition to all religious groups all religious philosophical groups i should say there were no religious groups really at that time uh, and he wanted to rule not by force but but what he called persuasion uh, again, a very important element, a democratic element that we can claim uh, today. Uh, but not only did he go uh, against the warrior ethic, he also went against what I call the word warrior ethic, which is so relevant today. Uh, because hate speech, he really went hard at what he called, what, what, what today we would call hate speech. And he said, when two radically different religious philosophical groups are living together face to face in the public domain, they should not stop talking ab about each other's uh, religious philosophical worldviews. Uh, if I if I dislike something in the other person's worldview, I should not privatize it. I should not keep it to myself which is a classical strategies which are adopted by many countries, which of course we call toleration, which is privatization of hatred. I find something abominable. I find something very deeply reprehensible, but, and I have the power to interfere, but I, wish, I shall not interfere, even though I dislike it intensely and even though I, I have the power to do so. I'm not saying this is not a valuable idea. It's a valuable idea, but his idea was very different. He said, if you dislike something, say it. Say it to that person. But say it under three conditions. First, only if you have good reason to. Second, even if you have a good reason to, say it on an appropriate occasion. And third, even when the occasion is appropriate, say it moderately. Never immoderately. Don't humiliate the other. By whenever you're pointing out, what you dislike in that person's worldview. But he didn't restrict himself only to that. He also said that when you are, prefer a particular worldview or committed to a certain worldview, you will like something about it uh, naturally. And you, when you are in the face of someone else who's different from you, you'd like to say something good about your worldview. But again, do it. But do it 
under with three conditions, always with good reason, never on an inappropriate occasion, and even when the occasion is appropriate, never immoderately, always moderately. So he he laid the, the, the down the grounds, particularly at that time when people used to be braggadocious, uh, uh, you know, he, he laid the rules that you should never self-glorify and never say that you are the best, you are the greatest. And he had reason to uh, do that because he said, we are all imperfect. When we come together, we are looking, we are searching for some perfection. And that search is a common search in which all of us must join together and the only way in which we can uh, achieve, possibly achieve that perfection, or at least grow, there will be some ethical growth if we exercise two virtues that I mentioned are very crucial in democracy, sanyama, which is restraint, self-restraint, and bahushruta, which is listening to the many, not just listening to your own people, uh, only people of your kind, but listening to people who are different from you. And it's through Bahushruta and through Sayama that you en enter into, you have a mutual, uh, not only mutual, uh, will you enable your own worldviews to grow. And by that, the there will be growth of Dhamma in general. You know, the... the uh, so uh, uh, of, of universal uh, ethic or universal morality, which of course is, which he felt was non-existent in, that is, in his own time. Now, uh, this is a very important, I think these are all features of, of these, are, these are all what I call elements of the democratic tradition, which are present in India and which shape the thinking of people like Gandhi, Nehru, and earlier, you know, in, his, in the second phase of his life, Ashoka, they were part of, actually, it, I think it is very much part of the pluralist imaginary, political imaginary of India. I can't uh, substantiate this point, but I'd like to make a claim that this is something that was present in the past in a number of uh, polities. I think the, I, the second thing I mentioned, uh, which I will say very briefly because I think I've run over time, is, is the Ganasanga Trunk tradition, which is government by discussion. That's, again, a very important idea, which was present in the past in India. And the third uh, is uh, the idea that there are certain spheres of social life which, are, which, should be not, which shouldn't be uh, uh, where, where political intervention is unnecessary, uh, where people uh, it, it must on their own uh, uh, decide uh, uh, what, how to manage uh, the self self regulation and self government in the social sphere, which is quite independent of what is happening in politics. Of course, the, we are we are over politicized people, and and of course democracy encourages that. But but uh, there are elements in the Indian tradition which tries to uh, keep these two not totally apart. That is impossible, but relatively a part where citizens uh, of a polity can make decisions not only by entering the formal public domain, but maybe this is something like the panchayat system about which Mani has talked, uh, you know, knows a lot. Anyway, the point that I'm making is that these are these uh, two traditions are both there in India. They are present in, in, in their living traditions. There is a contest going on even today. And this contest is really about the soul of India. Uh, I think until our anti-colonial movement, and which ended in the, the birth of the Indian Republic and the making of the constitution, was deeply inspired by what I call the democratic tradition. But even at that time, it was contested by the anti-democratic tradition, after all, Many of these uh, uh, horrible ideas, uh, 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 the perfection of these ideas really took place in the 1920s and the 30s, both on the Hindu and on the Muslim side. This is the first time that I'm using these terms. Uh, but uh, 
but uh, I think there is a much greater uh, uh, sort of, uh, I wouldn't say revival, but uh, much greater exuberance with this, uh, by, uh, uh, with which the anti-democratic tradition is being uh, innovated, uh, and and uh, and it seems to uh, it seems to have really people felt that this tradition has finally been victorious. And uh, like many speakers have said uh, uh, today, I, I think we've managed through this elections to put some kind of a break on 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 that and and on the triumphalism that accompanied it. And there is a whole lot of work which is to be done in order to bring India back, to restore India back to its to 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 the path that is uh, laid down uh, by the democratic tradition. And I I, I think I'd stop there. I had promised you an intellectual treat, and I think you've received it. Um, I certainly neither wish to summarize what he said, nor make a comment myself, but uh, Rahul has asked me to say something about these issues. And what I'd like to say is that there was only one time in 1910 where in London that Mahatma Gandhi and Veer Savarkar met. So Gandhi was not the Mahatma at that time. Um, Virayak, Virayak Savarkar was not the Veer. But they clashed on the interpretation of the Mahabharata. Savarkar took the war literally the war that is described in the Mahabharata, literally. While Mahatma Gandhi took it metaphorically. So while Savarkar's interpretation was that the Mahabharata glorified the Hindu in, an, in acts of violence and in acts of war, Gandhi said, that it was a metaphor for the fight between good and evil. And this division between one view of what religion means in India and another view of what religion means in India has currently manifested itself in a battle between one idea of India, the Savarkar idea of India, and the other idea of India, which I would describe as the Gandhi Nehru idea of India. And it is the same matter of interpretation of who we are and what we are uh, supposed to be in terms of goodness that is being fought out today on the electoral field. As far as Savarkar is concerned, he always regarded Ashoka, whom uh, Emperor Ashoka, whom Rajiv Bhagavad described with some length, as the biggest enemy of India, because he said that this man, Ashoka, held violence to have held, the Ashoka held non-violence against violence, thereby demasculizing the Hindu. And Savarkar contrarily said, and I literally quote from him, that a Hindu realizes himself in violence. This sentence is from the best biography of Savarkar that uh, I think we have in India. It's by a man who's named after Savarkar, is Vinayak Chaturvedi. And uh, he calls this book Hindutva's Violence. So you have these two interpretations. One, 
which bases itself on Ashoka's non-violence, the other which bases itself on the importance of violence as being the means by which you discover yourself. Savarkar wrote a book called The Six Golden Epochs of Indian History. They're all about the happenings in the three or four centuries that followed Ashoka. For Ashoka's successor, Pushyamitra, rejected the philosophy of nonviolence and became a great warrior. And at that time, there were invasions that came in from the Huns, the Bactrians, and others. And it is the interplay of these which were described as victories for the Hindus, because while on the battlefield, they may have lost the battles, eventually they converted all those who came in during those centuries of violence into Hindus. Uh, or into Buddhists. And this distinction between the role of violence and the role of non-violence is really what fundamentally divided Savarkar from Gandhi and therefore the BJP from the India Alliance. Furthermore, Gandhi wanted, and he mentioned this, but he mentioned it in passing, Gandhi wanted the constitution of India to be based on local self-government. And his argument was that in the past, in the hoary past, while emperors could conquer vast amounts of territory, they couldn't govern that territory from the center. And therefore, there had to be administrations in each village, in each habitat, in each settlement. And those instruments of local administration were called panchayats. And what Gandhi wanted was that the constitution of India should be built in such a way that Indian democracy had elections only at the village level for the panchayats directly. And at all other levels, they should be indirectly. That is to say, the members of the local bodies should elect the members of the intermediate body. The members of the intermediate body would elect the members at the district level. The members of the district level would elect the state assembly. And the members of the state assembly would elect the central central. Parliament. And he made this argument because he didn't use these words, but it's common in India today to talk of money power and muscle power. Gandhi instinctively understood that our politics would become both violent and corrupt and completely based on illegitimate criteria like caste if we had direct elections to Parliament. So he was drawing on a very ancient system of governance in India and democracy in India. Whereas Nehru wanted us to go straight into the Westminster model with modifications. And Ambedkar agreed with him, which is why we got a constitution that has been heavily influenced by the constitutions of several Western countries, particularly Ireland and the United States of America, of course, with Westminster being the basis. And this is called a colonial mindset by the BJP. The BJP always wanted centralized government. And this afternoon, I was making a reference to what lessons India could learn from German, German history. And what I had in mind was that Savarkar and Goldwalker were deeply influenced 
by the rise of the Nazis in Germany. And Kohlmarker showered praises on how race relations, as determined by Hitler, should inform the Indian system of how there should be no inclusivity on the basis of common citizenship, but discrimination by the majority against the minorities. In Germany's case, it was the Jews who were targeted. In India's case, it was the Muslims that Savarkar and others targeted. And they wanted a very centralized system. They had a man called B.S. Munje, who went to Italy at the invitation of Benito Mussolini, came back and said that that is the ideal organization. So the RSS was set up on the model of the fascist in Italy. The ideology was deeply influenced by Nazism. So what we have in the RSS is a combination of fascism and Nazism. And that is why I think the German case is of great relevance to us. It is these two schools that have contended for the soul of India for a short while, lasting from approximately 1957 to 2014. We had the Nehru Gandhi idea of India today. There was a serious disruption when two extremists, Savarkar on the Hindu side and Jinnah on the Muslim side, agreed that India was not one nation, but the home for two nations. Jinnah's point was that the Muslims are not a community, they are a nation, and therefore entitled to a land of their own. Gandhi said, don't do it, because what you'll create is permanent enmity between Muslim Pakistan and Hindu India. And what Gandhi had envisaged has in fact come to pass. For 10 years now, there has been no connection, no dialogue between India and Pakistan. And it has created a situation in which tension is allowed to grow, is encouraged to grow. And the fact that Pakistan is in a political and economic mess is leveraged to say that India is doing so well, Pakistan is doing so badly, why should we deal with them? And when one suggested, as I did in an interview, that we ought to remember that Pakistan has a bomb, he fell like a ton of bricks on it, saying, you want to negotiate out of fear, not at all. I said, we also got the bomb. And responsible nuclear powers talk to each other. The, the Americans never broke diplomatic relations with Russia. The Americans never banned Russians from visiting America. It's, it is this mentality which excludes. And the mentality that excludes the Islamic Pakistani by definition of that, excludes the Indian Muslim. So that is how Modi in his mind reconciles his kissing any sheikh and any sultan and any Islamic tyrant of West Asia on the cheeks, on both cheeks, and hating the Indian Muslim and hating the Pakistani Muslim. Because the Pakistani Muslim has stood in the way of an Akhand Bharat. And the Indian Muslim, with 200 million people, stands in the way of a Hindu Rasht. And that is why the the long history of India, which Dr. Bharga was uh, surveying, has a complete resonance 
in the India of today. There are now two competing Indias, ideas of India. One, the idea of India as a composite country, as one which has absorbed, assimilated, and synthesized whatever came from outside, irrespective of how it came, which celebrates the Muslim heritage along with the Hindu heritage and all the civilizational achievements of India, which looks upon the Taj Mahal with pride, which looks upon the Pulwalo Ki Sair in Delhi at Mehrodi as something that the Prime Minister should attend, which looks upon the uh, audio of Nizamuddin as somewhere where you should go and pray along with Muslims. And in India, which says that the Muslims are completely irrelevant, they are invaders, they are aliens, and the Hindus who converted to Islam are traitors to the Hindu cause. This is the battle that is going on in India today. The earlier tendency, and it's astonishing that it happened in the aftermath of partition, that in the aftermath of partition, seeing the horrors that religious extremism inflicted upon the people, they've all turned and said, no, we don't want this anymore. And therefore, a secular India was possible. But now, 75 years later, when the Muslims are cowed down, the BJP is in need of an enemy. And so it creates one. And it describes Muslims who are patriotic, who demonstrated their patriotism in three different wars with the Pakistanis, who have the opportunity to go to Pakistan and decided to reject that opportunity and thereby passed the patriotism test. They are demonized, whereas the Hindus who couldn't go to Pakistan are celebrated for not going to Pakistan. And the favorite abuse of the BJP is to tell you to go to Pakistan. They've said to Shah Rukh Khan, who is a great Indian uh, cinema hero, they told him, go to Pakistan. They told Amir Ali Khan, go to Pakistan. They told Saif Ali Khan, go to Pakistan. They pick on the idols of Indian youth who are not looking at the religion of a person, but at his abilities uh, as to be the icon, they pick on all of them and tell them, go to Pakistan. They never say, go to Indonesia. <laughs> they never say, go to Saudi Arabia. They never say, go to Bangladesh. They always say, go to Pakistan. And that's what they say to me. <laughs> well, if you want to be friends with them, yeah, go to Pakistan and take your daughters with you. Now, this kind, this is the battle whose background was being given to us by Dr. Bhagwan. And I think it is very necessary that the idea of India propagated by Nehru in the discovery of India and by Gandhi, who said famously, and it's written up in Broadcasting House even today. He said that I do not want the windows of my house to be stuffed and its doors to be kept closed. I want them to be kept open so that the winds of the world blow around me. And then he added the crucial sentence, but I refuse to be blown off my feet by any of them. So India's genius has lain in preserving what it has got and synthesizing whatever comes from outside. And the end result is a composite India. Somebody was mentioning, what does a composite India mean? You know, we have tailors in India. We didn't have any before the Muslims. We have barbers in India. 
still most barbers are Muslims because that profession was regarded as dirty. In my own village, I used to be asked to sit on the road outside the house in order to shave myself or to have my hair cut because they said that hair is beaten, it is dead, and we cannot have it inside the house. We've progressed beyond all that. But today, there is a reactionary move to pull us back to the manus, to celebrate the kind of institutionalized discrimination for which India is notorious and which still affects us. When uh, John Judd Harris was mentioning where the Muslims, where the Hindus, uh, the Brahmins were dominating despite their small number. I pointed out to him that he forgot to mention one place where the Brahmins are also to be seen disproportionately. The Indians in the city. All of them belong to the highest caste. So this institutionalized democracy uh, discrimination was opposed by the Muslim concept of musawak or equality. And when the scheduled caste of India saw that the emperor washed himself before prayers in the same pool that the leper washed himself in, and that when he went inside the mosque, there was nobody who was a priest there was a Mukhavadi, that is the leader of the prayer, but each person prayed himself. And the most important part of the prayer was the dua, where individually it was decided that Allah is multilingual and can listen to each person and has the capacity to listen to several people at the same time. And so you got down to asking for the most mundane things. Please, God, find me a wife. Please, God, get rid of this wife. Please, God, let me pass an exam. Please, God, let me get an increment. These were the prayers that were being asked and answered by us. And no wonder this was an attraction for those at the bottom of the ladder in India. And yet, after 666 years of Muslims being on the throne of Delhi, from 1192, when Muhammad Ghori rose to the throne of Delhi, to 1858, when Bahadur Shah Zafar was deposed, it's a total of 666 years. After 666 years on the throne of Delhi, when the first census was taken in 1872, it showed that only 24% of Indians had become Muslims. And how did the Muslims rule? Babur wrote, who was in India for only four years, from 1526 to 1530, he wrote a letter to his son saying, if you want to inherit and preserve my empire, please don't interfere in the religion of the local people. And after one or two of the slave kings indulged in excesses, the lesson dawned on the Lodis, even on the Kilji, certainly on the Tughlaqs, that you can do military conquest but don't conquer people's souls. And that is why India alone had an encounter with Islam and neither defeated Islam totally, as happened at the Battle of Tours and at the gates of Vienna there in Europe. They either got defeated totally or they were victorious totally all the way from Pakistan to Mauritania, you had Muslims. When they crossed the Straits of Gibraltar and occupied Iberia in the same year 
that Muhammad bin Qasim came to India, they ruled there from 712 till 1492. And yet, you go through that area, Sevi and Cordoba and Granada, there's nothing but the ruins of Islamic rule to see. But in India, you see the Muslim influence and you see the remaining Hindu influence. There is no quarrel. It's all being artificially engendered. And it's being artificially engendered by one party or one idea of India. And it's being opposed by another idea of India. So I would ask you, Muslim, to please dilute your theory that there is no difference between the Congress and the BJP. There is. In action, yes, there are lapses. But in thought, there is a clear distinction between what the BJP aspires to and what secular Indians aspire to. And that is a distinction we should remember because it is critical to our heritage. And of course, there are tremendous <laughs> regional variations. I don't find in my constituency, by coincidence, there are exactly as many percentage of Muslims as there are in the country as a whole. But we have none of the problems that beset the Muslims of North India. Because the Muslims of my constituency are all rich. They get money from Tripod. They own large properties of land. They are not uh, interfered with in their mosques. And when I was surprised to find it at Hindu weddings that there were a very large number of Muslim invited regularly, I asked discreetly, how is it that you have so many Muslims at Hindu weddings, which I don't see in the dawn? And they replied, we don't regard the Muslims as a different religion, but as a fifth caste. So there are ways in which integration happens. And I'm very grateful to Dr. Bhargav for having presented to us the two alternative ideas of India, which are still in Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, and now I invite my colleague, uh, Dr. Sayyid Hussain Zahani, to make a few concluding remarks. And with that, we can go to the philosopher's box if we don't want to do the talk. One of, one of the advantages of Dr. Zahani's presence is that he was born and brought up in the same country which, uh, which first thought about the idea of the Hindu on the other side of the system. <laughs> it's something that is more foreign to us than to Persian. Thank you. Friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's a tremendous honor to stand before you as we conclude this re remarkable conference on the future of Indian democracy. I know it's been a long day and some of you are already thinking about the nice evening walk to Philosophical Bank or catching that football match tonight, Germany and Denmark. So I promise to keep my talk short. We have delved into various facets of India's democratic journey facing the critical questions about its future. Will India's democracy demonstrate resilience? Or are we veering towards authoritarianism? Or, as Yugen Rayada suggested, might we be transitioning into a third republic? Why none of us can predict the future with certainty? We are social scientists, 
not astrologers. We can look at historical and current trends to speculate on what lies ahead. Democracy, as we know, is not just about casting to votes and electing leaders. While these are fundamental elements, they are far from sufficient. Our discussion opened up the black box of democratic processes, ideational foundations, and institutions. We explored significant threats to Indian democracy, such as the rise of majoritarian ethno-nationalism driven by Hindu ideology. The secular inclusive vision of India's freedom movement leaders enshrined in the constitution is under threat from a narrative of Hindu supremacy that marginalized minorities, especially Muslims. We have seen the personalization and centralization of power, the rise of prime minister office, and erosion of checks and balance like Supreme Court, Parliament, and institutions like Election Commission. The decline of opposition in 2014 and 2019 elections painted a bleak picture, yet there is a glimmer of hope with the formation of the India Alliance ahead of 2024 election despite the recent NDS continued victories. Marginalization of minorities is not just political, but extends to socioeconomic conditions and citizenship rights, often accompanied by violence. Civil society organizations, crucial pillars of democracy, face attack through weaponized laws and regulations. While organizations like the RSS promote majoritarianism both nationally and internationally. Media freedom, too, is under the siege with major platforms bought, to, but, uh, uh, bought by crony capitalists and laws that curb independent journalism. But is the future is entirely bleak? Absolutely not. We are not witnessing the end of democracy, but phasing of <coughs> what we call competitive authoritarianism. The 2024 election and recent state election show that democratic backsliding can be confronted. A strategy is like uniting all parties with democratic values, empowering regional leaders, engaging civil society, and promoting a secular inclusive vision rooted in India's civilizational heritage are essential. Precise and pragmatic welfare measures to empower marginalized groups are crucial to counter the dominant ethno-nationalist regime. Now, before we wrap up, I have the delightful task to extending or Heartfelt thanks to those who made this event possible. First and foremost, a huge thank to you, all organizers. Department of Political Science, South Asia Institute at Heidelberg University, led by Professor Rahul Mukherjee, and my dear colleagues and friends, Tanya, Matthias, Matthias, Pratik, and Mia. The Protestant Academy Bad Board, guided by Dr. Karola yes. Offer. Your tireless efforts and commitment have been the backbone of the conference. We also extend our gratitude to our supporters. I should not call the J. Adivas Coordination Germany, Evangelical Mission in Solidarity, Intercultural Promoter Program, Baden Württemberg, Northeast India Forum, Zud Asian Fact and other anonymous supporters whose contributions are deeply appreciated. Your support has been invaluable in making this conference a reality. To all speakers, panelists, and participants, thank you for your insights, your passion, and your dedication to the cause of democracy in India and the world.
you have turned this conference into a vibrant arena of ideas and discussions. Thank you and safe travels. Enjoy your evening, whether it's relaxing walk, Hauptstraße, Philosophenweg, or an exciting football match. Thank you. Thank you.